First off, I want to say thank you very much to the welcome you've extended to me. A special thanks to Skip Shan and to Reverend Martha for the conversations, their own wonderful reflections and ideas that have flowed and circulated and found their way in part of what I'm going to say today. I just want to begin, though, with a clarification. Just for the record, my name is Stephen Sharper, not Stephen Harper. <laughs> the uh, SC in front of my last name is very important to me at this time in history. <laughs> when talking about the environment these days, it can be a pretty gloomy picture one paints. And so it's always remember, it's always important to remember that there are liniments of humor in our lives that sustain us even in the darkest times. So I sometimes begin such reflections with an attempt at humor. Now, you notice I'm not claiming this is a joke. I don't give it that high elevated status, merely an attempt. And this is the story of an avowed atheist who is hiking in Banff National Forest in the National Park enjoying a beautiful, lovely setting. And as he's hiking, he encounters a grizzly bear. The man stops, the grizzly stops. The man panics and starts to flee through the forest. And the grizzly goes right after him, bounding after him. So running willy-nilly through the forest, the atheist begins to pray and says, dear God, please save me. And God says, well, your whole life you've denied my existence. Why should I save you now? He says, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, understood. Okay, well, at least make the bear a God-fearing Christian. <laughs> so God says, that's done. It is done. The bear stops, the man stops, and the man turns around and looks at the grizzly. The grizzly bends its gigantic head, folds its mammoth paws, and begins to pray. Dear God, for the meal that I'm about to receive, I'm truly grateful. <laughs> Send me better ones, okay? I'll give you my email later. Um, uh, also, when trying to connect our spiritual lives, our faith lives, what is sacred to us, to the non-human world, I often find it's helpful to do some collective meditation or reflection. So I invite you to a kind of collective meditative moment. My apologies to some of my students who may have heard this already. But I'd like to have us all go on a collective journey, a collective time travel, if you will. And we're going back in time about 200 years. But we're not going very far. We're going to the shores of Lake Ontario in a little settlement called York. And we hear a sound day and night. It's a constant undulating roar. It's the sound not of lake water lapping with low sounds on the shore, but of wind blowing through the climax Maple Beach forest that goes north the shield, east to the Ottawa Valley, west to present day Windsor and beyond. It's a vast, deep, dark forest. And day and night we hear the wind blowing through its treetops. Some of us write in our journals about this experience. A few of us are thrilled, but many of us are afraid, for it reminds me and them and us of the tempest-tossed journey from the old world to the new. Today, 95% of that forest has been cut down, and the remaining 5% stands in jeopardy. Now I invite you to fast forward, but not to the present, but to your past, a place in your childhood where you could be in nature as you saw it, a place where you could collect your thoughts and yourself. It could be a backyard, a garden, a lake, a cottage, a ravine, but a place 
in non-human nature, where you could relate and find a modicum of focus and tranquility. Put yourself there now. Does that place still exist? If so, how is it preserved? If not, what happened to it? Was it paved over for a housing development? Was it blacktop for a parking lot or a convenience store? If so, how did that quote, end quote, development make you feel? Did you chalk it up to the inexorable march of progress? Or did you see it as a body blow to your spirit? And if you did see it as a blow to your inner spirit and core, then perhaps you saw it as a spiritual loss. And you see a connection between your spirituality and the fate of this earth. And you have a sense, perhaps, of what our Aboriginal brothers and sisters may have felt when their sacred lands were taken from them and developed. And so this is a horizon of exploration that the churches and religions around the world are now encountering. What do we have to say as people of faith as the major ecosystems of the world are being shut down. And I want to share here a selection from a work by David Orr, O-R-R. -R. David is an environmental educator at Oberlin College in Ohio. And he's written a provocative essay called, What is Education For? And I just want to go through the beginning of that essay with you. David writes, if today is a typical day on planet Earth, we will lose 116 square miles, or 300 square kilometers, of rainforest, about an acre a second. We will lose another 72 square miles, or approximately 117 square kilometers, to encroaching deserts as a result of human mismanagement and overpopulation. We will lose 40 to 100 species, and no one knows whether the number is 40 or 100. Just to break from the text for a moment, we are forcing into extinction on a daily basis species that have not been identified. Certain species, such as certain species of lightning bug, exist only in one square kilometer. It's estimated of certain areas. So when that area is developed, that species is gone. Today, the human population will increase by 250,000, and we will add 2,700 tons of chlorofluorocarbons to the atmosphere and 15 million tons of carbon. Tonight, the Earth will be a little hotter, its waters more acidic, and the fabric of life more threadbare. The truth is, or continues, that many things on which your future health and prosperity depend are in dire jeopardy climate stability, the resilience and productivity of natural systems, the beauty of the natural world, and biological diversity. It is worth noting, or continues, that this is not the work of ignorant people. It is rather largely the result of work by people with BAs, BSSs, BSCs, LLBs, MBAs, and PhDs. Eli Wiesel, the wonderful writer about his experience in the Holocaust, makes a similar point when he says that the designers and perpetuators of the Holocaust were the heirs of Immanuel Kant and Goethe. In most respects, the Germans in the 1930s and 40s were the best educated people on the earth. But their education did not serve as an adequate barrier to barbarity. What was wrong with their education? In Wiesel's words, quote, it emphasized theories instead of values, concepts rather than human beings, abstraction rather than consciousness, 
answers instead of questions, ideology and efficiency rather than conscience, end quote. I now want to ask with you, to what extent does such a judgment apply to our communities in which we find ourselves, to our educational communities, to our faith communities? How many of us who are well-meaning and well-educated may have missed the primacy of creation in our formation and life ways? I just want to share a little anecdote that occurred with a minister friend of mine after Al Gore had visited the University of Toronto several years ago and had spoken to Convocation Hall. And he spoke to me after a worship service and said, Steve, I hear all these things about Al Gore. I hear he's only doing this for money. And I said, well, actually he set up a foundation. So the money from the documentary and the book are going to a climate change foundation. He said, well, I also hear, Steve, that he's just joining the bandwagon, that he's a Johnny come lately to this movement. And I said, well, his book, Earth and Balance, was written in 1992. And also, he was testifying in the US Congress in the 1980s about climate change. And my minister friend stopped and said, you could almost hear the scales fall and clink on the slate steps of where we were standing, and he said, how in the world did the church miss this as a real moral issue? This is a real moral issue. 